I'm trained as an economist. Most of my work is in decision theory, both individual and the group decisions. And to me, at least, uh, I don't think you can seriously talk about group decision making in an ethical vacuum. I mean, in economics, there are some people who try to do that, but in my opinion, this just leads to bad ethics, not to no ethics. All right, the specific topic I want to address today is based on joint work with uh, Charles Blackaby and David Donaldson. They've been my co authors for many, many years. They're both enjoying their well-deserved retirement now. They spent uh, most of their careers at the University of British Columbia. I spent a couple of years there. I went back there to visit them on many occasions. I, go back, I still go back, not to work, but uh, just to hang out with them. At any rate, so this project is on uh, population ethics. It's been a while that we worked on that, but I thought it might be, and uh, Marty agreed that it would be a good fit for this workshop. It's something we worked on for many years, and basically what it is, is uh, essentially we're trying to establish a theory of goodness. And uh, this theory should be sufficiently comprehensive to allow us to accommodate population change. And when I talk about population change or variable populations, I think from the very outset it's important to note that uh, when I say population changes, that involves people being brought into existence, right? If there, is, if there are people who do exist or have existed and we want to talk about uh, whether their lives should be shortened, this is not a variable population problem. These people exist. As soon as you're born, you have full moral standing and uh, changing someone's uh, lifetime does not change their existence. You cannot be unborn, right? What it changes is, again, the length of their lives and possibly the lifetime utilities. Our approach is uh, what we call welfareist, or it's usually called welfareist, in the sense that all that matters for our social goodness relation that we want to establish for our notion of goodness is uh, the levels of lifetime well-being that are achieved by those who ever exist. I, I want to stress this again that we're talking about lifetime utilities, not uh, well-being. I, I use utility and uh, well-being uh, synonymously here. Excuse me, if this, for some of you, you may think there are distinctions, but uh, if there's ever any confusion, just ask or tell me, I, and I'm happy to clarify. So when I talk about uh, lifetime utilities, it means we, want, we look at people, their well-being, how they assess themselves and how society should assess their lives as a whole. Like if you, talk, if you just talk about well-being in a single period, that doesn't give you much information and it can lead to terrible decisions. I mean, if somebody is uh, temporarily in a, bad, in a bad spot, for example, somebody may be depressed, you're not going to talk about population consequences uh, just because you anticipate someone may develop uh, such a condition in a short period or, or some period of their times rather than their entire lives. All right, so the basic hypothesis where we are welfareists in the sense that only well-being matters. Welfareism can be generated from more fundamental assumptions. One we like is, uh, that goes back to Goodin, who says, well, if you have any kind of notion of goodness, if you declare something to be better than something else, one state of the world to be better than another state of the world, then this better state has to be better for at least one person. We think it's very hard to argue with that, and uh, that, that, that takes you a long way towards uh, notions of welfareism. The other thing I want to say from the, from the outset is that when we talk about lifetime utili utilities, implicit in that again is that our descriptions of possible states of the world are comprehensive in the sense that they refer, that they contain everything that might actually be of value to people once they're alive. Right? We want to, so we have a comprehensive notion of well-being, and with this comprehensive notion, we want to focus on welfareist principles, that is, notions of goodness that depend on individual well-being only. Uh, one important uh, issue that arises in population ethics is, uh, obviously, how do we make comparisons when the populations are different in two situations to be compared. One uh, hypothetical question, well not actually a question that we have to address, uh, not only hypothetically but uh, in practice, is how do we treat the arrival of a new person? And again, as welfareists, that boils down to asking ourselves what kind of uh, level of lifetime well-being or expected level of lifetime well-being do we want this additional person to have to declare this a situation that is as good as the initial situation before this person was brought into existence, or what the le level of the levels of lifetime well-being will make the new situation better or worse than the initial one. Well, a very common principle that's used in population ethics is what we call classical or total utilitarianism, 
where you basically add up the well-beings of everyone who ever lives. You compare this for two situations. You can do this, of course, with variable populations, right? For in, in one case, you, you add over, say, 50 million people are alive. In the other situation, it might be 18 million. Whatever the numbers are, you can always calculate these values and come up with an answer by comparing them and saying, this total, this situation gives us uh, an aggregate level of well-being that we consider preferable to, to another one. A competitor of that is average utilitarianism, but I won't talk much about that because I don't think anyone working in population ethics takes average utilitarianism seriously as a contender because it has terrible, it makes terrible mistakes on both at both ends. Because it says, for example, if you have a population where everybody has a very <coughs> high standard of living, very high level of well-being, if you ask yourself, should we add someone that is just tiny, tiny, a tiny bit below the average, but still has, a, by all reasonable standards, if we have a very, very good life, average utilitarianism utility, would say, no, we don't do that because it reduces the average. And uh, the consequences are even worse at the other end. If you have a population that everybody is totally miserable, and you ask yourself, should we add someone who is totally miserable by all standards, but a, slightly, a slight tiny bit above uh, the average, again, would be considered a good thing, and I don't think anyone uh, is uh, really in favor of principles of that nature. Now coming back to this notion of uh, what happens if we add an individual, what typically what we use is uh, what we call neutrality, the notion of a neutral life. And a neutral life is a life that is considered by the person leading it as a life that's considered as good as the alternative in the sense that it, a life without uh, any experiences or a situation of non-existence. I've deliberately mentioned the version of uh, the definition of neutrality in terms of uh, the absence of experiences because you can define the notion of neutrality without having to refer to states of non-existence. We think this is of importance because sometimes people try to extend the principles of unanimity to non-existing people and say, well, somebody who would uh, enjoy her or his life if brought into existence gains from being brought into existence. We don't think it's plausible to make such a claim because if you don't exist, you cannot gain anything, right? Mm -hmm. So again, this is, uh, there is uh, to us, there is clearly an asymmetry between existence and non-existence and begin between beginning of life and terminating life. Term, terminating life. All right, uh, coming back to the, uh, I would say, most popular criterion, most popular theory of goodness in the, popula in the variable population context, classical total utilitarianism. It has a serious shortcoming, we think it's serious, that has been uh, pointed out a long time ago, more than 30 years ago, by Derek Parfit, and he called it the repugnant conclusion. What the repugnant conclusion says is basically you can have a situation where everybody is extremely well off, they have a very high level of well-being, lifetime well-being, and according to the repugnant conclusion, the <coughs> principle is such that you can find another situation with a larger population where everybody is as close to neutrality as you like. That means, and the uh, total utilitarianism would say this second situation is better. Right? Parfit didn't like, didn't like this uh, conclusion, he called, again, he called it the repugnant conclusion, and we agree. It seems to us that if you apply a principle like total utilitarianism and you end up declaring a situation where everyone is as close to neutrality as you like to be better than a situation where there are fewer people but they're happier, that's a serious problem. Now, the, um, I, I mean, I've, I, we don't have much time here, so I can only give you a quick flavor of uh, the project uh, that uh, Chuck and David and I were working on, what the outcome is. I mean, maybe we have time in the question, in the, in the, in the context of questions to say a bit more about it, if you want to know. <coughs> Basically, our suggestion, our proposal is to modify classical or total utilitarianism by introducing a threshold. In principle, if you think about classical utilitarianism, or total utility, you add up utilities, but what, do, what, what you're doing is really doing a little bit more. Coming back to the notion of a neutral life, if we normalize a neutral life to a lifetime well-being level of zero, which is again very common in population ethics, how, how you choose such normalization doesn't really matter. What is important is that you have to keep it in mind when you compare different principles. You have to judge it relative to this normalization. So basically, what the total utilitarianism does is it looks at a society, members of a society who are alive, who are brought into existence, 
and it calculates the differences between their lifetime well-being and the level of neutrality. I mean, of course, it simplifies dramatically because if you normalize it probably to zero, there's not much to calculate. But we take this, so we take this idea, but we say, well, instead of neutrality, let's take a utility level, a threshold that is above neutrality, right? If you can think of it as a minimal acceptable standard of living, a poverty line expressed in terms of <coughs> lifetime well-being, and you say, well, instead of adding just these differences, the gains over neutrality, you have to do a little bit better in order to bring somebody into existence and call this a good thing, all else equal. This has to be above this level, is for our lifetime well-being has to be above this uh, threshold. Notice that uh, it shared this, uh, what we call critical level utilitarianism, shares with the classical utilitarianism the feature that this critical level is constant. That is, it doesn't depend on uh, the distribution of well-being under consideration. And there are very good reasons for that. Because uh, only these principles are principles that satisfy what we think of as a very plausible independence property, in the sense that if you consider, for example, the situation, remember when I said people who are alive, these are people who ever lived, and uh, have been brought into existence, remember you cannot be unborn, once you're, once you're, born, you're born you exist, all right? Suppose you have a situation, and let's, let's pick someone uh, in history, Cleopatra, for example. Suppose we have an idea about uh, what uh, Cleopatra's lifetime well-being may have been. Not, it's probably not very easy, but let's suppose we do that. And on the basis of that, we calculate our criterion, that we, our goodness criterion. We say, well, one situation is preferable to another. Now, suppose somebody came up and said, well, we found out uh, Cleopatra suffered from some terrible, incurable illness, and her life was totally miserable, so her lifetime well-being was a lot, lot, a lot lower than we had previously thought. Should this change our decision of uh, two, situations, two states of the world that we make today? We think not. And this kind of independence property, independence what we got of unconcerned individuals who, are, who, are, who cannot possibly be affected uh, by such a comparison, will actually give you a fixed critical level. So that, and that by itself immediately rules out rules such as uh, average utility, right? Because if you calculate averages, Cleopatra matters. And if you find out the Patras utility or lifetime well-being wasn't what you thought it was, you have to change your comparisons all over and start all over again. So this principle of this independence property actually drives, first of all, that we have to have a fixed critical level. And it, uh, it derives the uh, very simple structure of uh, utilitarianism where you just add up things. Right? In principle, you could think of much more complex operations to aggregate uh, individual levels of well-being. But what uh, this independence property, along with very standard uh, requirements such as equal treatment of equals, respecting unanimity, etc. What that gives you is you have to have such a simple additive structure. You can even add in some inequality aversion if you're, if you're so inclined, if you think utilitarianism doesn't pay attention to inequality in well-being. You can add uh, an increasing tra transformation to these utilities and make the whole criterion inequality averse. That can all be done. So the upshot of, uh, and we, we've done that in, I mean, I don't know, I don't have the time to go through details, but uh, and I, didn't, I didn't bring a copy of our book, but it is available <laughs> <laughs> if anyone is inclined to have a closer look. So the upshot of, of this is, uh, and I mean, in the book you get it in five-part harmony and bells and whistles, but uh, the, the basic idea, the message that we try to bring across is our proposal to do population ethics is to use what we call critical level utilitarianism, which again adds up not just gains of uh, well-being over this uh, over neutrality, but over the critical level that is above neutrality, and doing that al allows us to avoid the repugnant conclusion. Now, in terms of applications, I th we think that, um, when I say we, I mean my co-authors and I, not, this is not the majestic way. We think, uh, we think that most, uh, if not all, well, not, probably not all, but most public policy decisions have, a popu have po population consequences. I mean, anything that involves policies regarding birth control or development aid that can be given in form of consumption aid, or population control aid, such as education. We all know if you educate people, you, uh, you, if you put more women into the workforce, the birth rate will go down. Right? So applications are all over the place. In a sense, to us, it's a very important uh, aspect of, an, of a theory of goodness to accommodate these variable population issues. We've done some of that in the uh, development context. 
my two co-authors are in earlier work actually have done a different uh, project uh, that involves the use of uh, animals in uh, experiments and as a uh, sort of food source and they, they used the critical level utilitarian criterion to show that uh, for most intents and purposes if you want to do research, if you want to use animals in research, they obviously the animals suffer. What, what this done is typically you, animal use at current levels tends to be too high because uh, many of them, could, many uses of animals could be uh, replaced by tissue cultures, for example. And uh, again, but in, in order to talk meaningfully about these issues, it is important to have a criterion that uh, encompasses these uh, ideas, and again, that's what we're trying to accomplish uh, in this project. I'm done. Thank you for the <coughs> for the talk. Um, so, you talked about the total principle and the average principle, yeah. and your way of avoiding, level. Of yeah. avoiding both. Um, and I'm wondering how you would. Uh, favor your solution over um, Herka's proposal from 1983 had a paper called Value and Population Size, which is sort of in between the total principle and the average principle. So at low population size, you get a very steep increase of value with increasing population size. But then at very large population size, you know, basically flattens out and you get almost no um, <coughs> As long as well-being is constant, you get almost no additional value by, by having still more. So how would you, um, well, what would you have to say about that in comparison? Poor guy has to depend on Cleopatra. So it, it, it does compare, okay. And like it's not in the OIA, because as soon as you use something like averages, uh, you have to be able, you have to allow uh, people who are, who are not affected because their lives are over. That's to affect the decision that uh, is of consequence for people today. Okay, so because it becomes more like the average principle, exactly. it repeats. Exactly. You do not the same. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how uh, critical level utilitarianism deals with not only the well-being to the individual, but the externalities of the existence of that individual to others. Oh, well, so it deals with it in the sense that uh, our notion of well-being takes into account everything that is of value to an individual. So if your well-being is affected by the new person, this is taken into consideration. Okay. Yeah. But if you're, uh, this, is, this is a very good point and an important point. If this were not the case, it would be much more questionable what we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Clearly, if we say sometimes somebody, somebody's lifetime well-being, this has to be very comprehensive in the sense that uh, it takes into account everything that might be of value. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, back to Cleopatra. This may this is this comes from a completely ignorant person outside the world of yeah. knowledge that you're speaking in. Why would dead people matter in the first place? I completely agree. You have to ask an, uh, an average utilitarian. That. <laughs> yeah, but what, they must have some logic behind thinking that in the first place. My guess is uh, this has happened. Uh, Again, I'm, I'm not aware of, any, aware of anyone in population ethics who thinks average utility hmm. is, a, is a good idea. Right? So we all agree that people who are not currently here do not matter? If, uh, if, we, if in two, two situations to be compared, they had exactly the same lives, no, they shouldn't matter. We completely agree with that. But uh, you, you'd be surprised sometimes. I mean, I think one of the problems is that uh, people, for example, in economics, are only too quick in translating what they've been using for a long time into other fields. For example, we often look at average GDP as a uh, or gross domestic product per capita as a measure of uh, well-being of a society. I mean, even that it, to me is debatable, but uh, it certainly should not uh, have found its way. And it, 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 it really didn't find, it, find its way into population ethics. So one more very late. What's the difference between non-existence and a life with no experiences? Other than there's a body there that was born. That the, that the body is born. That the person who, is, who, exi who exists is capable of making such a comparison. It, the only reason I say, to me, it, actually to our theory, it makes no difference whatsoever. I just mentioned the two possibilities because sometimes people say, my life is above neutrality if it's better than non-existence. But all, all I'm saying is, you don't have to invoke states of non-existence to define neutrality. That's, so that's the only reason. That's, that's the only reason. That because obviously, a person yeah. who 
has yeah. no experiences cannot judge. Yeah, but the their person with experience can imagine what it what it would be like without any experiences. What I want to make sure is that uh, we don't go the other way. We, I would I would never want to say that somebody who doesn't exist can can imagine existing, mm -hmm. which is very very different. Right? But I mean, this is just a minor point, just to, just to, to illustrate that. No, but in reproductive ethics, it's a huge point. Oh, yeah, I understand. I understand. No, no, a minor point from, from the, for our theory. Okay. Yeah. So I have another question from someone who doesn't know things. Um, um, when you say the life expect, li life, uh, um, lifetime well being. Yeah. I mean, people have various, uh, they, they live for different. Oh, um, different life, so absolutely. is it the expectancy that you you're looking yes, at? Or yes, yes, for the entire yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, that depends on on, on all the features uh, of a population. Absolutely. Um, okay. but, but that's what I'm saying. The uh, no, our notion of lifetime well-being has to be very comprehensive, because that's uh, to us at least it's an essential assumption in order to use something that's welfareist, in the sense that this is all that matters to the individual. Absolutely, it has to be very very comprehensive. Yes. So if I live 70 years, yeah. my life has more well-being than if I lived 10 years? Not necessarily. If the 60 years are shitty, there's no, 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 no seriously, absolutely, there's no guarantee. I mean, you may, your lifetime well-being may, may drop dramatically, especially if, when, as you get older and you develop all kinds of nasty diseases. There is, I mean, at some point, I mean, I made my living well. <laughs> I want to avoid exactly that situation, but clearly there's no guarantee that a longer life makes you more happy. Absolutely not. It may or may it may not. Interesting. So just a clarification question. Mm -hmm. uh, so how does that compare to the measure that many people use, which is qualities? Mm. Well, qualities are, I think, a way of uh, trying to make uh, principles more operational in the sense that they come up with uh, something specific to measure. I mean, what I'm, what we're doing is very fun, in a way, very uh, based on uh, the fundamental notion of well-being. And then, of course, the next question is how do you measure well-being, which I haven't touched on in this talk, but it's a very important issue. And yes, qualities are one way of trying to quantify more precisely what uh, what well-being might look, what might be. Yeah. So in that sense, there is no conflict at all between between. If I may, so I, it's a bit strange, but I'm going to try and defend the average utilitarian. Um, Good luck. Why couldn't they just <laughs> Why couldn't they just say, well, we only consider people who are who exist today, and what do you do tomorrow? Well, I may drop that to, at the end of this talk. <laughs> so once but you died, you're out of the equation. No, you're you not out of the equation. No, that's the important thing. That you, if you die, you're not unborn. You'll, you still exist, you still existed. Your lifetime well-being matters. If you don't do that, uh, then you can say, well, my decision tomorrow, I have to, don't have to do anything with my decision today. But then that's, I mean, their lives matter. Peter, are you going to defend further? <laughs> uh, maybe later. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, last question. Okay, so um, if I could uh, offer a, a, another conclusion that at least I consider repugnant, that mm -hmm. I think both the average and the total principle yep. uh, imply, whereas Herka's uh, variable value view escapes. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering uh, what you think the critical level utilitarian view. Um, so, so basically it's this. Uh, what we've been doing recently is systematically replacing non-humans with humans. So human population size and consumption has been increasing, increasing, increasing. Populations of other species have been collapsing. And um, if you're a, either a total or a average um, utilitarian and you think humans in general have higher levels of well-being than these others, then basically that's a good thing, and we should keep on doing it. Whereas uh, Herka's variable value view, at least if you're calculating value within a species before summing it, um, would, would actually escape that kind of repugnant conclusion. And we can image, escape it too. It, 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 you oh, would escape it, okay. So we can, oh yeah. Would, I mean, could you say a little bit about how? Yes, uh, the uh, work I alluded to by my co-authors on uh, actually they call the paper pigs and guinea pigs, uh, note on the ethics of animal exploitation, is they use our criterion. What you can add, yes, they use the well-being of uh, non-human animals. You can do it with one way of doing it. Is if you don't want to treat uh, non-human animals equally, you can give them, let's say, a lower level, a lower critical level. Mm -hmm. Or if you're very concerned mm -hmm. about uh, these other species, you give them the same, or even a higher, higher level than, than humans. I mean, mm -hmm. 
many uh, non-human animals are a lot more agreeable than many humans are. <laughs> but uh, in print, I'm, I'm just saying it because in principle this can be done, right? So, uh, and th that's exactly what they used, again, a, a good a notion of goodness that encompassed not only humans but also non-humans. So that can, actually, that can be done, yes. Is there a paper? Yes, pigs and guinea pigs. <laughs> no, it's the title of the paper. Fixing guinea pigs colon a note on the ethics of animal exploitation. It's by Blackaby and Donaldson, but uh, I strongly recommend you just get our book instead. <laughs> <laughs> it's in there. Sorry, sorry. Thank you.